Welcome. Uh, we're going to start right away looking at chapter 16, aromatic compounds. We've kind of seen these guys before, but now we're going to get into what exactly makes aromatic aromatic. So the first thing is to look the difference between aromatic and what we call aliphatic or fat-like compounds. Our fat-like ones are just a linear long chain, alkanes and alkenes. And aromatic is just a whole different uh, beast. I mean, the first thing is to look at a kekule structure. Kekule or kekule. Spell it. K E K A U L E accent. Kekule which is essentially a cyclic structure of a benzene. But the big thing between that and the aromatic is the is its localized bonds. So when we look at, say, this structure, 1,2-dichlorobenzene, we can imagine bonds here. But you can also imagine the structure like this, where we put the double bond between the two chlorines. Now these two, these individual structures are the Kekule structures. And of course these will undergo a very fast equilibrium, uh, but both of these are still distinct. The resonance structure is the averaging of both of these structures that where they both exist simultaneously that neither one is favored we actually get an average of the two so like if i'm looking at any if we have a billion molecules at any one time neither of these are favored so you're going to have a 50 50 mixture of each but they're going to be rotating so one structure is not if i look at individual atom it's only going to exist in one of these two structures, but it will interchange. It will interchange. So, uh, the bond order essentially is one. It was due to the, the, I mean, when we do this, we symbolize this as a circle in the center because we essentially, the pi delocalization so we actually draw this, when we imagine this, we put them in brackets to say, oh, it's gonna be you know, a rapid interchange between these two structures. Uh, well, we will use the Kekule structures when we draw mechanisms of this. In reality, we will see a resonance. And what makes aromatic is these series of double bonds that results in a very high energy, high residence energy that you would see otherwise. So just quick look at this. Uh, compare a cyclohexene versus a benzene. Cyclohexene, if I put it in the presence of potassium permanganate in water, we all know that's going to oxidize this into a diol. If I use bromine in a chlorinated solvent like carbon tetrachloride, we're going to brominate this alkene, Re reduce it down. pretty easily. But if I do this same reaction with uh, benzene, we're going to have no reactions on both. No reaction. We're going to have no reaction with, oh God, with potassium permanganate. And we're going to have no reaction on or bromine. Neither one will react because we have such higher activation energy barrier to break this 
special aromatic conjugation. We can add bromine to the double bond. Uh, we can add d bromine to this benzene structure, but it is a completely different mechanism and a completely different form of addition. Because what actually happens is when we add bromine, we're going to use a special catalyst, iron tribromide, a special catalyst, CCL4. And what's going to happen is we're not going to break a double bond, but we're actually going to remove a hydrogen and add a bromine in its place. So it's a completely different thing. This is because of the unusual stability of benzene. Benzene has a certain amount of resonance energy. If we look at this, just look at the, going back to, look at the, act, the energy of reaction for hydrogenation. We hydrogenate this with one H2. It's gonna be the delta H of that is something like 120. If we do two isolated double bonds, remember we talked about that when isolated double bonds, it's just the doubling. There's no conjugation energy, 240. If we conjugate this guy, suddenly we have a certain strength. Put that there, put that there. Suddenly it's 232. So it's two energy less. Oh, sorry, negative 120. It's eight, sorry, it's eight kilojoules less because it costs eight kilojoules more, this conjugation energy. If I do the same thing with benzene, It's not just another eight kilojoules less. It is actually, we get 208 kilojoules to remove all of them. 208. Hypothetically, hypothetically, the three, this should be negative 360 if we add each one individually. It should be 360, but it's not we get 208. This is because that first hydrogen addition is so endothermic that these, that it drags everything else down. So essentially instead of 360, so once we put the first one on, we can get 232 to remove the second and th third. So that means that first one must be, first addition must be positive, what, like 24 for the first one. And then negative 232 for the other two. So now resonance isn't true for all conjugated rings. To be a con, to be aromatic, we cannot just slap a bunch of double bonds in a row and that and, may, and hope for a aromatic system. There is very special cases. It's gonna come back to our, our molecular orbitals again. And so we gotta think about that. If we look at, if we look at these annulenes, these rings with conjugated pi bonds, not all of these are gonna be aromatic. There's four, we all know six, six is good, but we have four, six we could do eight. Oh, god help us on eight it's a pain in the butt crawl one two three four and there we can go ten ten we just do it we look funky Looks like two benzenes in a row. Where is oh there? I know why I screwed up right there. Okay, ten. Now, 
all will have two Kekulei structures, but only six and 10 are actually aromatic. All of these will have two different Kekulei structures, but only these two are actually aromatic. And this is due to the molecular orbital of these. So in a planar 6P orbital, so let's look at benzene and look at how this 2D cyclic system requires 2D molecular orbitals with the possibility of two molecular orbitals with the same energy. So there are going to be a couple degenerate orbitals. A couple degenerate orbitals. Remember, degeneracy is when the orbitals have the same energy, just like all 3P orbitals having the same energy or all 5D orbitals having the same energy on the electron diagram. So... So some of the rules we got to keep in mind. We are going to have six p orbitals. So we're going to have six mo's total. The lowest energy will be the all bonded, no nodes. As energy goes up, the nodes inc must increase. And as the, the molecular orbitals will evenly be divided into in bi bonding and anti-bonding orbitals with possible non-bonding P orbitals in between. In a stable system, so a stable aromatic system will have find filled bonding molecular orbitals and empty pi star molecular orbitals. Now let's draw our different energies. So we're going to have energy diagram that looks like this. I'm going to try to find room. We're going to have four different ones with oh, geez. all these in the blow being pi, all these in the above being pi star. Now, since it's flat, I'm going to just look at this only from the top. Look at this only from the top. So drawing this, like saying... Gonna draw six hexanes real quick. So if they're shaded, we're looking at the top of them, and if they're unshaded, we're looking at the the other option. Stamp this so that we can see these a little bit better. Okay, our first. Molecular orbital, our lowest energy molecular orbital, as I said, is the all bonding. So they're all in the same phase. Our second one will be, of course, half of one phase, half of the other. So, uh, so we have a, a node clearly right through the center. Now, the other one will also have one node, one node. But how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna do this? Well, we're gonna put these two, because we're gonna draw a vertical line. These two are here, and these two are there. And so our node actually is right through two so these two center p orbitals become non-bonding p orbitals, separating this. So because of that, they're just coming out. So they, essentially, we have two bonding orbitals, two bonding orbitals, and this one, all six are bonding orbitals. Now, looking at this, we have we got to put it in two different nodes. We're going to have a node in the center and a node through here. And so we end up having a structure that looks like this. There's our two anti-bonding orbitals. Now this guy is gonna be look a little different. So I'm gonna have uh, So 
how's this looking? We have a node through this diagonal and a node. Oh, and a node through this diagonal. So we have the net effect is we have two regions of bonding, but we have four regions of antibonding. So the net is four regions of antibonding. The, so the net is two regions of antibonding. And then the last one, of course, is just going to be everything is ugly. Oh, we got every line is going to be where everything is going to have a, a, a node. So we've got three nodes. One, two, they have six regions where they don't match up. Uh, there's no regions where they do match up. So looking at that. Looking at that, there's our six molecular orbitals. If you look at this, this is similar to our shape. Oh, crap. This is similar to our benzene put on its point. The structure benzene put on its point. Well, energy level, energy level, energy level, energy level, energy level. And the energy levels kind of match with there. Now we have six electrons. So we must put in the lowest energy first. Then we put, we must completely fill the degenerate orbitals before we pair them up. And we have six electrons. We put that in there. And what we see here is that all the bonding orbitals are filled. None of the antibonding orbitals are filled. And so this is this allows for maximum energy savings when we delocalize this. Let's look at uh, four, which is actually not so good. So four are alkene or diene. Make a bunch of boxes. There's actually four energy orbitals here. So obviously, stamp in. For God's sake. Whatever. Okay. Putting it in there. So we have our all bonding. Then we have our half bonding. And we have our half non bonding. So, well, we have all anti bonding. Okay. Looking at that. Now looking at these guys, these nodes, we're looking at how many interactions are bonding and how many interactions are not bonding. In this case, we have one interaction, two interactions, three interactions, four interactions. In this one, we have two interactions, one and two, but two anti-interactions, one and two. So in each of these guys, the net bonding effect is zero bond order. So even though this does contain some bonding, it also contains equal amounts of antibonding. So this is counts as a non-bonding orbitals here. And this one has zero overlap and four regions of non-overlap. So negative four. So when you look at this, we have four electrons. We put in one, two, three, four. So in here, this guy has filled in two electrons in the bonding orbitals, but also two electrons in the non-bonding orbitals. This makes the same shape, putting it on his edge, energy level, energy level, energy level, energy level. These being the non-bonding with equal amounts of bonding and anti-bonding. 
Now, the HOMO, meaning the HOMO and highest occupied molecular orbital is a diradical, thus makes this structure, this, al this diene, cyclopentadiene, very reactive, this diradical. So this does not hang around. This is not stabilized by aromaticity. So what we can have is we can have what's called the polygon rule. When setting up a molecular orbital diagram, we're going to set the structure so that the point is facing down uh, to accommodate all the bonding orbitals. So in a six member ring, you saw I put it point down on this. I put point down. If I have a, let's see, like, like a five membered ring, five membered ring is going to be point down. And we're going to draw a line approximately through the center, approximately through the center. And aromatic, and we can label things aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic accordingly, based on this polygon rule. So we're going to try to, let me see. So for aromatic, so write down these rules, aromatic. So anti-aromatic, we're going to label B anti-arrow and C just for non-arrow. So to be aromatic, we have to follow these rules. One, cyclic with, with conjugated bonds. Bonds. It must... Each atom, each atom must have an unhybridized p orbital. And thus be able to be, be localized. P orbitals. So that means I, I can't, I mean, this guy could do it. but this guy could not because this is a age age this is sp3 hybridized that couldn't be sp2 hybridized so and 3 the uh, it's like let's see the, the unhybridized p orbitals must overlap to form parallel orbitals. Overlap of p to form parallel orbitals. Orbitals. Essentially, it must be planar. What it almost always is planar. And then finally, the delocalization of pi lowers energy. And that, that's essentially what this does, lowers the energy. That's what it means to be aromatic. We essentially lower the energy. Now, to be anti-aromatic, we follow all the same rules except four, in that four is four A, one four B, it's like blah blah blah. The delocalization of pi increases energy, so it actually is better to be non-aromatic than it is to be anti-aromatic because it actually destabilizes the system. And here's the hard thing. Here's the hard thing. A lot of things that you might predict to be anti-aromatic, if they're large enough, they will force themselves out of planarity 
to get rid of their anti-aromaticity. It lowers the energy to be non-aromatic. So to be non-aromatic, it just, there's no conti continuous P orbitals. Basically, if I don't have two or I don't have three, it can't be aromatic. So in this example right here with the cyclopentadiene, uh, they don't all have P orbitals. Right there, that immediately removes that. So looking at some of those rules, if I, this got, how does this guy differ from this guy? I mean, essentially here, you don't have, uh, it's not a ring, not cyclic. I mean, yes, they're all in P orbitals, but you can't shift this down without the ring. Looking at this structure versus this structure. So this guy ha is higher energy. This guy's higher energy than the aromatic. The aromatic is stabilized, but this guy, as we said, is very reactive. So it's actually better to have just butadiene rather than cyclobutadiene because the butadiene is higher energy because of the cycl cyclization. So what we can use here is to a hard, fast rule to determine aromaticity or anti-aromaticity is called Huckel's rule. Huckel, so H U umlaut C K E L for continuous conjugated annulines. Aromatic annulines will always have four N plus two electrons for aromatic. If you have one, two, and three covered and you count how many electrons you have, 4n plus 2, you will always have aromatic. So that means 6. So if n is 1, 4 plus 2 is 6. If n is 2, 2 times 4 is 8. 8 plus 2 is 10. So 4, so 6, 10, 14, 18, et cetera, et cetera. We probably never get that big. Usually zero, one, two, three. Technically alkene, but uh. now if it has four N electrons, it would be anti aromatic. Aromatic. So our case of uh, butadiene, cyclobutadiene, yeah, that's anti aromatic. Now you would you would expect four, eight, twelve, but octatetrine doesn't actually work because octatetrine is not pl planar. C eight H eight, see, it becomes not planar to break anti aromaticity not like a non aromatic it's going to force itself to be non planar so in in general in large annulines they will rather break planarity to become non aromatic rather than stay planar and be anti aromatic so remember the big thing is planarity is necessary for aromatic or anti-aromatic. So if you had something to force it to be planar, well, that would be another situation. But given some degree of shifting, uh, it would prefer to be anti-aromatic. Okay, so let's look at some of these structures. Uh So like aromatic ions, like CP plus or CP star. So cyclopentadienyl cation or cyclopentadienyl anion. Drawing that using the polygon rule. 
We have energy level, energy level, energy level, energy level, energy level. So CP plus versus CP, CP minus, cyclopentadienyl anion. Energy level, energy level, energy. So the line is for our homo or line for the aromatic versus anti-aromatic is going to be right there. Well, the pi versus pi star is going to be there. So these guys, CP, you have four electrons because normally you'd have five, but you're missing one. So one, two, three, four. Now CP star or CP minus would have six electrons. Normally you'd have five, but you've added a minus. So you have a lone pair on that center curve. So you'd have six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So in this case, this guy is anti-aromatic and this guy is just aromatic. So CP minus is the one you want. It's going to be the aromatic. So when we represent this, you have cyclopentadiene with the circle and the minus in the center. So meaning, and what actually this results is if you have a cyclopentadiene, one of its protons is particularly acidic. If you look at this, the pKa of proton loss, remember pKa, that is how easy it is to lose a proton versus if you compare just a uh, cyclohexene versus a cyclopentadiene, the pKa of this guy is 16. That's high. But compared to this guy, this guy's pKa is 46. 46 means ain't going to happen. You need some kind of mega base. BK of 16, you need a strong base, but it is within range. I mean, you got to think about it. Water has a pH range between 14 and uh, well, 0 and 14, but that doesn't mean there's not more stronger things out there than water. Everything's just compared to water most cases because of that's a solvent we usually use. So you give, uh, real quick, you put, like, say, uh, cyclopentadiene and a methoxy. Well, actually, this is tetrabutyl methoxy. Anion. So C, put that guy in there, and you're going to form, easily enough, CP star. And of course, tetrabutyl, tetrabutanol. So it's easy to form due to this aromaticity, but it's not more stable than benzene. It's not more stable than benzene, but it's easy enough to form. Now, uh, CP positive is not likely to form at all. So it's you're not going to be able to say uh what well, like steal a bunch of electrons there it's just not likely to form because it's what is it higher energy so it'd much rather keep the proton than gain energy to go to cp plus now looking at the c7 version the c7 plus for c7 minus so same thing c7 plus c7 minus so we got, oh God, oh God. One, two, okay. One, two, three, four, five. Shoot, no, okay. Okay, there we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think that's about right. If I did that, C7 plus 
would have six electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. All of them paired up. CP, C7, H6 plus is going to be aromatic. The other way, C7, H7 minus, well, H6 minus would have, same thing, boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So C7 would be anti aromatic if it was planar. If it was planar. So what we see is a tropillium cation pretty easy to form as so long as we have a, a, a in the right conditions. So Let's draw this, do, do, do. We have OH in the presence of a acid, do SO4, we protonate that, we kick that off, and then suddenly we have a, a cation C7 aromatic region, tropillium cation. So. Uh, do, do, do. So looking at that, uh, let's see. The tropillium cation, uh, the tropillium anion, as we talked about, what's the likelihood of losing an H? The, the pKa of an H on there would be for to form the anion, pKa, something like 39. Very poorly acidic. It's very reactive, so it's not going to want to lose that. That's still slightly more reactive than alkane, but it's not likely to happen. So uh, just a quick look. Now, as I said, Octatetrine is not, would, if it was planar, it would be aromatic, but that's cut, it would be, so if it's planar, it's anti aromatic. But if it were to lose two electrons or gain two electrons, it could suddenly be aromatic again. So if you put two equivalents of potassium in there, you could give it two electrons and then it becomes a, 10 electron system, suddenly it's aromatic again. Looking at that, what's it? One, two. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, so one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you give it two more, nine, ten. And we have three filled bonding orbitals, two filled non bonding orbitals. What makes it anti aromatic essentially is having those radicals, those radical electrons, two radical electrons. It's what's making this too reactive and unstable. We can look, this is only looking at, say, uh, this is only looking at uh, heteros, uh, that's only looking at basic carbo, carbocations. What about heterocycles? Can we do this heterocycles? And the answer is yes. Just gotta remember these heterocycles can provide more than one electron for aromaticity purposes. So normally the carbon only provides one because they can either provide one electron or they can donate a whole lone pair. So like, for example, pyridine. Pyridine, this guy is going to count as aromatic. It has a pKb of 8.8. .8. Uh, it's like 
the six-membered nitrogen ring with the nitrogen in the plane. Known pair here. So PKA of 8.8. .8. So it's very basic. It will undergo substitution, but not addition. The pyridinium cation can still be aromatic because it's donating one electron. It's only donating one electron. Boom, boom, boom. One, two, three, or five. That nitrogen only needs to donate one to stabilize this. So that means that lone pair is not being used in the aromaticity. So it means the pyridinium cation can still react. It can still lose a lo that lone pair, still use it up, still act as a base. Now pyrrole, on the other hand, pyrrole is a five-membered nitrogen. Let's look at this. So ch -ch -ch. lone pair, and there's a hydrogen here. This pyrrole instead it has a pKa of 13.6, much less basic, much, well, sorry, has a pKa of 13.6. So it's actually acidic rather than basic. It, this is guys gonna be aromatic. It's a weaker base than pyri pyridine, so it's not going to be basic. It's going to be acidic because if it's pro pronated, it's no longer aromatic. Looking at our rule here, double bonds provide four. One, two, three, four. If it, the nitrogen only provides one, it is still one radical. But if it provides two, it's aromatic. So that lone pair is in the plane. I would say the lone pair is out of the plane so as to be planar with the rest of the lone pairs. In this case, the lone pair in the top structure is in the plane to be perpendicular to the lone to the p orbitals of the uh, of the structure. So if it if this becomes uh, pronated that lone pair is used up and thus it can no longer be aromatic, which is why this, it can easily lose this hydrogen and still be happy as long as it doesn't affect this lone pair. We got another structure, pyrimidine. It's a six membered dinitrogen, dibasic structure. So nitrogen, it's one three dinitrogen structure. Boom, boom, boom. Now it's dinitrogen. We have a lone pair perpendicular to the p orbitals. We don't need these nitrogens. We only need one electron per nitrogen. If I look at uh, imidazole, it's a five membered 1 3 dinitrogen. Boom, boom. Just like these, this one has one basic nitrogen, one acidic nitrogen. The bottom nitrogen can be acidified. Uh, the bottom nitrogen is, is basic. The top nitrogen is acidic. And we can actually have purines, which I won't really look at it, but it's tribasic. But purine is a bicyclic pyridine and imidazole. That's our, those are present in our, what, like, in some of our like bigger, like, biomolecules. Uh, let's see. If this were to become, though, this imidazole, if it were to become pronated, then the nitrogen set can actually be equivalent. So, like, if I pronate this, H, H plus, we can then actually resonance between 
the two structures. It's an eight. Do, do, do. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, crap. No, sorry. That stays there. We actually resonate between those structures. H plus and those. Well, that's just fun. But so you got to think about this when you when asked questions about whether this is acidic or basic or whatnot, you're looking at resonance. Are these is that lone pair needed to achieve resonance or is that lone pair just there in the plane? If it's in the plane, it's not being used. We only need one electron. You don't have to worry about it. If it's out of the plane and it's in part of the P orbitals, we need that. Got to think about it. Aromatic doesn't want to react. It's not acting. It's going to react. So you can look at that. Finally, looking at some of the furans and the oxygen-based rings. Furan is a Remember our five-membered oxygen ring? We have two lone pairs. Okay. As we saw with the oxygen, uh, we always saw, as we saw with the uh, oxygen, uh, these guys are going to be aromatic. Oh, as we saw with the nitrogen, these guys are going to be aromatic. Because it's five-membered, it needs to provide a lone pair and not just one electron, but we have two lone pairs, meaning we have one lone pair in a P orbital and one lone pair in a SP2 hybridized orbital. So one lone pair is in the plane, one lone pair is coming out of the plane. And the same thing with thiophene, the, uh, the structure, the sulfur derivative of furan have one lone pair coming as a P and one lone pair in the plane. Both of these are aromatic. They're going to be planar with a perpendicular lone pair. So now you can also have polynuclear uh, aromatic hydrocarbons like fused rings like naphthalene, C10H8. H8. Yeah, look at that. Does that follow the Hugel rule? 10 electrons, 4 times 2 plus 2, 10. Yep, that's aromatic. Anthracene, that's, that's 3 fused rings. That's 14 electrons. That achieves the Hugel rule. Also aromatic. Phenanthrene, which is, uh, let's see, which is, uh, it's it's like anthracene. It's just bound differently. So, if we start adding more rings, it's going to decrease the stability. But you can have these. These are more likely to add bromine to form. Uh, two separated benzenes than they are to try to add bromine and break one of the double bonds. They'd rather split these molecules in two than uh, than add a than lose their aromaticity. So, some quick nomenclature of some of these guys. We're going to look at some of the. Uh, rules of IR and finish up this chapter. So nomenclature. So we know our basic group, but so when we have an alcohol group, this becomes a phenol. There's some common names, phenol. Uh, if we add a methyl group onto a basic benzene, it becomes toluene. For a nitrogen group onto a basic on a simple benzene, it's aniline. Uh, 
uh, if I add a methoxy group onto a, a benzene, it's anisol. If I add a vinyl group, which is a an alkene onto that, it becomes styrene. And if I add a acetyl group, uh, the methyl ketone, well, ethyl ketone, it's acetophenone. Oftentimes, we're going to have disubstituted, disubstituted uh, benzenes, and we're going to name these some simple things based on whether it's one, two, one, three, one, four. If it's, if I'm going to call that R and X. If we have Rx in the one, two position, we call that ortho or O. If we have it in the one, three position, it's meta. You may have seen that term when we talked about meta, chloro, peroxy benzoic acid, and one, four, it's called para. Okay. Now, now if we have tri substituted, we will just try to give them the lowest numbers. So it's not an easy naming like ortho meta para. We'll just try to give them the lowest numbers possible. And if the substitution pattern is not specified, like, so if I have R, we often just put the uh, substituent coming out of the center. So if we don't quite know what this is, or we don't, or we have a mixture, we can just put that out coming out of the center to say it's coming out somewhere. So for example, you can have ortho, meta, and para xylene. A xylene is a two methyls in a on a benzene. However, we could have mesidine, which is only one, three, five substituted. It's a trimethyl benzene. Now, if you combine a alcohol with a toluene, and you can have various substitution patterns here, you could have a cresol. So orthocrisol or meta. Now, going forward, when we look at benzyl groups, we will often that we call this the phenyl substituent. Often, I'm going to either abbreviate it as PH or a circle with a slash to it, like a zero. That's the phenyl group. Not to be confused with the benzyl group, which is specified by, which is C6, H5. So that would, so that would be C7, H, H7. This is C6, H5. That this one has a CH2 there, which will work its way into the conjugation, usually one way or another. Okay, some quick properties before we finish up is that uh, benzenes will typically have higher boiling points and higher melting points than any non aromatic because of stability. It is all based on the symmetry and the packing. So if there's anything that disrupts the packing, we're going to lose this. Like parasubstituted will have a higher melting point than ortho and meta substituted because of the, the packing efficiency. And typically these compounds will be a lot denser than non-aromatics. A couple quick properties. When remind you, we're looking in the IR. The CC aromatic double bond occurs approximately 1600. Uh, in the NMR, if you get to that NMR, 
the hydrogens are typically at 7.2 or higher. So it's pretty high to have a CH aromatic. That's usually a dead giveaway, especially with the alkene. And the, uh, and the carbon NMR, they're between 120 and 150. Uh, I'm not sure if you went over mass spec too much, but mass spec, we will almost always see a 91 peak, which is usually due to the benzyl cation or something related. So benzyl cation, because this is so darn stable. Almost always see that peak. And they'll see a bunch of other fragments due to that. And finally, uh, UV vis real quick. UV, you, simply, you typically see three bonds, uh, three bands, uh, strong, low band, bands, a moderate, uh, 204 nanometer band and a weak third band at 254. So, so you'll see a couple different stretches, a couple different absorptions. A weak low band, I mean, a strong low band, not really specified where it's at, a moderately sized one at 204, and a weak one, which is the benz benzoid band. Okay, that is the end of that chapter. That is where we're going to end. I've combined a couple different. Uh, a couple different uh, what lectures together just to get this through. So, thank you for your time. We'll start next chapter. Get chapters uh, next video looking at chapter seventeen.